Welcome, Rui Showman. It's such an honor to have you with us. And uh, I thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It's such an honor. I heard your story many times, and every time I hear it, it's uh, really inspiring. And I think it will help a lot of people to be inspired by the faith, by the work of God in our lives. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me, and I hope so. Uh, that's what I do it for, not for the big box. Great. Can you share with us your conversion testimony, like what happened to you, and also a little bit of your background, like? Sure. Um, and you're welcome, you know, you're welcome, obviously, to um, interrupt or, or ask questions or whatever. Thanks. Okay, uh, my background, I'm Jewish. Um, I'm all I'm in the Catholic Church. I, I've long since been baptized and been a daily communicant and so forth. But um, I still consider myself Jewish. I don't know how many Jews you know, but it's awfully hard to be Jewish and just think you've stopped being Jewish. Uh, so I consider myself a Jew in the Catholic Church. But anyway, I, I was born and raised very Jewish. My parents were both German Jewish Holocaust refugees. They had both been born and raised in Germany and escaped um, in the er relatively early days. My father escaped in the very early days of Hitler, but my mother um, got caught up more in the Holocaust, but she eventually uh, escaped. And uh, they independently made it to the United States where they met and married and I was born. So I was basically born in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. And um, I uh, was, as I said, I was raised Jewish. And the reason I bring that up about the Holocaust is because, uh, boy, boy, um, it, it wasn't really animosity, but there was far more separation between the Jewish community and the Christian community in those days, immediately coming out of the Holocaust. There was more anti-Semitism in um, the ordinary world in, in the United States. And there was more um, fear of Christianity, let's say, among the, within the Jewish community. So they didn't mix nearly as much as they mix today. And uh, growing up, all my friends were Jewish. All my parents' friends were Jewish. Um, basically, the world that I grew up in was kind of Jewish. Uh, I went to Jewish religious education from the beginning of school until university alongside the ordinary secular school. And I went to MIT, which is a science engineering university, I think maybe the best in the world, or at least it was in those days. And um, now the best in the world is probably in China someplace anyway. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, and I lost my faith. I was quite devout, pious growing up, Jewish, of course. And God was very important to me. But uh, when I got to university, I basically got brainwashed into the pseudoscientific view that science is just a kind of superstition that man came up with until, excuse me, that religion is only a kind of superstition that man came up with until he had science to tell him, you know, to explain all the mysteries in truth and so forth. So um, I actually, when I was at university, was kind of convinced um, that one could not in good conscience believe in God. I wanted to believe in God, but I thought that you weren't allowed to because it was like too disproven, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, which is a really tragic attitude. And um, this is besides the point, but I, I did do a, a, a video series on YouTube, on my channel, which is uh, called Jewish Catholic, not the Jewish Catholic, but just the, just. Jewish, Catholic, all one word, uh, called science and faith, because in fact, um, science proves the faith. It doesn't disprove the Catholic faith. It proves the exactly. Catholic faith. Anyway, so um, I lost my belief in God at MIT, at university. And after a few years working as a computer scientist, I um, went to Harvard Business School and to get an MBA. And I did well enough there that they recruited me for the faculty. So I found myself as a professor of marketing at Harvard Business School at the age of 29. And that's really where my witness testimony begins because um, that's really when the bottom fell out of my world all my life since I was a small child. 
I knew there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life, which I thought would come from entering a personal relationship with God, which I thought would happen when I was older. I literally thought it would happen on my bar mitzvah, which is when the child is 13. I can say when the boy is 13, because actually by Jewish law, it's only supposed to be boys, but you know the world we live in, so now it's girls too. But anyway, when the boy is 13, there's a ceremony in synagogue, and he enters religious adulthood, and I really thought at my bar mitzvah that the curtain would, the veil would drop, and I would enter into a personal relationship with God. But when that didn't happen, it was actually one of the saddest days of my childhood. Um, but then pretty soon I decided the real meaning and purpose of life would come when I got a driver's license, um, like many, you know, 16 year olds and, uh, or, you know, when I left home or if I got into MIT or when I began my career, or if I got into Harvard business school and so forth. So I, I kept looking to external successes to give my life meaning, but I was already at this point more successful than I ever expected to be being a professor at Harvard. But life still had no meaning or purpose, right? We're just a chemical accident. We live for 80 or 90 years and we die and that's it. There's no meaning or purpose to anything. Things just happen in our lives. Um, You know, it's just a very dreary prospect. And um, so I actually fell into the worst despair of my life at that point. Life had no meaning, but there was no longer anything I could imagine in the future that might give my life meaning. And it was in that state, I was walking in nature early one morning when I received the uh, most spectacular grace of my life. I was just walking along all alone in this beautiful nature preserve when from one moment to the next, um, the veil between the spiritual world and the physical world disappeared. And I found myself in the presence of God. I found myself looking into the spiritual world, but that wasn't really the most important part. I found myself in the presence of God in a state of very intimate communion and communication with God, such that any place I put my mind, any question I asked myself, uh, I was shown the answer to. And also in a state of um, incredible intimacy with God. So um, I knew, boy, I knew, I mean, I learned so much in this experience, needless to say. First of all, I, I, I was looking back over my life as though I had died and was looking back over my life in the presence of God after I died. So I understood how I would feel about everything after I died. I understood that my two greatest regrets after I died would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. And um, all the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every moment of my existence, I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist coming from this all knowing, all loving God. Um, I understood, I saw that everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could be arranged coming from the hands of an all knowing, all loving God not only including those things that had caused the most suffering at the time that I thought of as the greatest disasters, you know, oh, if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today. Or if only that hadn't happened, then I would be happy today. I saw nothing could be further from the truth. Absolutely everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could happen to me that was arranged by this all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God, who not only arranged everything that ever happened to me, but had been watching over me every moment of my existence and caring about me every moment of my existence as though I were the purpose of all of creation, actually, as though I were the only person he had ever created. And as though in a very real sense, everything that made me happy made him happy and everything that made me sad made him sad. And that was by far the biggest part of this experience, right? There's never any reason to be anxious about anything. Absolutely everything that happens is arranged perfectly by some, by God himself, right? Who created everything that exists, that sustains existence itself. It's not like anything is outside of his control. And he cares about me more than I care about myself. Um, it, anyway, so there was no, no, never any reason to be anxious about anything. And most particularly, there certainly was never any reason 
to care about whether one is being loved or not, because the whole time one is being loved more than one could ever imagine from by God himself. So I obviously I knew the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and Master and God who was revealing himself to me in this experience. Any questions? Yeah, I wanted to ask you when you said that you saw that the biggest regret would be to not to to waste time and not do what is mostly valuable in the eyes of God. What did you feel was the most valuable thing in the eyes of God? Okay, two things about that. Maybe three. One is the way I thought of it at the time was most valuable in the eyes of heaven. Because I had this sense. I don't even know how to describe it. But I had this sense. I, I was seeing into the spiritual world, by the way, which is part of it. But, you know, we are being every, every action, every moment is being observed and recorded. And every action has a moral content that's being observed and recorded for all eternity. And it's as though there's this huge cloud, you know, of, of witnesses, you know, like observing us. And we will be rewarded for all eternity for anything we do that's a value in the eyes of heaven. So that's, that's how I perceived it. Um, I didn't perceive it as, as I mean, I, 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 I was in a state of communion with God. And I definitely perceived that everything in my life was arranged by God as a person. But the sense of being valuable in the eyes was more the sense of being, you know, getting the, being valuable in the eyes of heaven. Now, I had no idea. I mean, it's not like, I don't know how to put it. Um, you know, a question I asked myself at the time, I was shown the answer to. A question I didn't ask myself at the time, I wasn't shown the answer to. Something I didn't wonder about at the time, I, you know, I was not necessarily shown the answer to. So I don't have a formula. I have a formula now because I'm a well-catechized Catholic by what's a value in the eyes of heaven, you know, the spiritual acts of mercy, the corporal acts of mercy and so forth. But that's not how I was thinking at the time. Okay. Uh, at the time, I understood that the meaning and purpose of my life was to worship and serve my Lord and Master and God who was revealing himself to me. What, the, what actions were serving him, I'm, I didn't think about. What actions were worshiping him, I did think about because I know what worship is. Even as a Jew, I knew what worship was. So at the time, my concern was to know who this God was and what religion to follow so that I could worship and serve him properly. May, does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I actually prayed as I was walking. I was still walking. I was 100% conscious. I, was, uh, I prayed as I was walking along. Let me know your name so I know what religion to follow to worship and serve you properly. I didn't think of this religion as Judaism. I didn't think of this God as the God of the Old Testament. Um, I couldn't think of him as the God of the Old Testament. Um, that's a really interesting issue because it's not because the Old Testament is wrong. You know, the Catholic Church teaches very explicitly that Old Testament as well as New Testament is sacred scripture and it is the divinely revealed word of God. The Jews didn't get it wrong. They got some things wrong, but they... But they didn't get it wrong wholesale, so to speak. The, the truth is the entire relationship between God and man was transformed by the incarnation of the second person of the most holy trinity as a man. That was the whole point of Judaism. Um, there is a prophecy in the Old Testament. I think it's Joel, where the Lord says, the day is coming when you won't have to run to this person and that person and say, tell me about the Lord, because I will reveal myself to the lowliest manservant and maidservant among you. St. Peter cited that prophecy in the first Pentecost sermon. That's what happened when Christ came. In the Old Testament, God only spoke to the prophets and the patriarchs uh, and the priests. He did not speak to the ordinary people. He didn't even speak to King David. 
King David had to go to the prophet to find out what what the Lord was angry with him about and and what he was supposed to do about it and so forth. Um, and that was the God I grew up with. And because that was the God of the Old Testament. Jesus, when he came, Jesus had the a true divine nature, a true human nature in one person in the combination. It's called the hypostatic union of the human nature and the divine nature in one person. The divine nature and the human nature flow together like, you know, water and milk into a pitcher. And ever since then, human nature has participated in divine nature, at least potentially, in a way that had not been available before Christ. Anyway, that's all by way of saying, I didn't think of this as Judaism. So I prayed as I was walking along, let me know your name so I know what religion to follow, to worship and serve you properly. I don't mind if you're Buddha and I have to become Buddhist. I don't mind if you're Krishna and I have to become Hindu. I don't mind if you're Apollo and I have to become a Roman pagan as long as you're not Christ and I have to become Christian. This is because of the chip on the shoulder I had against Christianity. And he didn't reveal his name to me, but I went back home happier than I had ever been in all my life. I knew there was no reason to be anxious about anything. I knew we lived forever. I knew that ever, every hour had this infinite potential meaning because it had the potential for us to do an act that was a value in the eyes of heaven for which we would be rewarded for all eternity and so forth. I, I instantly lost interest in anything that wouldn't mean something to me personally a thousand years from now, right? It didn't make any sense. It was as though all my life I had been playing a game of Monopoly greedily accumulating this brightly colored monopoly money when next right next to me was a huge stack of solid gold coins that I had been ignoring. And now my focus was shifted to those solid gold coins. Now, (laughs) I don't want any anti-Semitic comments about how Jewish this revelation was. But anyway, so that was basically uh, the that was I don't want that was really the main part of my conversion. I still didn't know that it was Christ. I still didn't know it was Christianity certainly didn't know it was the Catholic Church, but that totally reoriented me from top to bottom. I can imagine. And uh, why did you have this, uh, like, uh, why did you reject the idea that it might be Christ? Okay. Uh, First of all, I want to make very clear, I had no animosity. I had no negative feelings about Christians or Catholics. Um, my, my, the, the one other student at MIT who I really wanted to be my roommate and I had to move heaven and earth to get him to be my roommate was a devout Catholic from the Midwest. Um, this, this had nothing to do with, with any animosity towards Christians because sometimes that's misunderstood when I give my witness testimony. However, Christianity to me was um, the cause of the last 2,000 years of suffering of the Jewish people. Uh, Jesus, to me, in my understanding at that time, was a false Messiah who claimed to be the Messiah but wasn't. His followers developed this religion that made the Jews out to be the great villains of the world, as a result of which Jews have been persecuted for the last 2,000 years. So actually, Christ was the villain of history, so to speak. (laughs) certainly the villain of Jewish history. Okay. And the Holocaust, um, we, I mean, we could debate, we could debate whether um, Christian teaching played a role in, uh, in the Holocaust or not. And that is a debate I actually like to debate, but um, that's irrelevant to this issue because in the Jewish world I grew up in, the Holocaust was seen as a indirect outgrowth of Christianity. Okay. okay. So it created a sort of sensibility, I can imagine. Like, uh, exactly. Okay. Exactly. And whether that was well-grounded or not, um, nonetheless, I, this is subjective. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I'm not giving general principles. I'm ex- exp- you know, answering the question about why I felt that way. Okay. And 
when you had this like sort of revelation, um, I heard in one of your testimonies, you say that you went into new age also, like you got immersed. Into oh, here's, here was my problem. My problem was I just had had this experience. Yeah. It was a mystical experience. Yeah. I had never heard of mystical experiences. I didn't know they existed. Um, literally. I, I, I didn't know revelation existed since the days of the Old Testament. I didn't think miracles exist. I didn't know miracles existed since the days of the Old Testament. Um, but here I am. I come back home, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in uh, the late 80s, um, having just had this mystical experience and caring about nothing other than finding out more about it, who this God was and what this meant and all the stuff, what religion to follow. So what can you do except find a mystic yeah. to try to teach you something, tell you something more about what happened? So that's what I did. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but, 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 you know, the only mystic I could find was involved in the new age. I mean, where else are you going to find a mystic? Yeah. So he kind of pointed me towards all kinds of stupid new age stuff. And I uh, spun my wheels for about a year looking into that stuff. But um, thank God I was doing one smart thing during that year, uh, which was every night before going to sleep, I would say a short prayer had made up to know the name of the Lord and God and master, my Lord and God and master who had revealed himself to me that day. And that would be my last, my prayer before going to sleep. And that was enough to result in a year after that first experience, having a, a very vivid experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, that put me on the right path. And now you're what, probably going to ask me to yeah. give more details. <laughs> what was this experience like? Well, I went to sleep after saying that prayer. It was a year to the day after that first experience. And so I also said a prayer of thanksgiving for what had happened a year earlier. And I went to sleep. I thought I was woken up. Now I understand that my body was asleep in bed. But again, subjectively, I thought I was woken up and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. And um, so I asked her about seven or eight questions, which she graciously answered. And then um, the audience was ended. Uh, after the questions and answers, she spoke to me for another 10 or 15 minutes. She said she had something she wanted to tell me about. Or tell me, I should say, not tell me about. And then I went back to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, uh, number one, I was hopelessly in love with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, I couldn't wait to see her again, which I thought would happen that night when I went back to sleep. I had no idea that it wouldn't happen again. But I knew it had been Christ in the first experience. And I knew I wanted to be as fully and completely Christian as possible. And I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. So those things led me I did take a detour into a Protestant church because I didn't know the difference between Protestant and Catholic. But as soon as I asked the pastor, what about the Blessed Virgin Mary? And he didn't give her the respect that I knew that she deserved. I knew this is no place for me. And, um, and I was spending all my free time at a Marian shrine about an hour from my house. And which of course was held by the Catholic church. So it didn't take me too long to find my way into the Catholic Church. And can you share some of the questions you asked Our Lady? And like, how did Our Lady, how did it sound like having this conversation with Our Lady? I see that you're remembering other witness testimonies. I've given yeah. <laughs> details from other witness testimonies. Um, first of all, um, the, the, in some ways, the biggest part of this experience was being in her presence. And just to be in her presence, to be in the presence of the love that flowed from her, was to be, first of all, totally overwhelmed by who she was. And second of all, to be lifted into a state of ecstasy, just from the pure love that flowed from her. Um, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. Um, 
I will say that although she was perfectly beautiful to look at, impossibly beautiful to look at, um, even more deeply affecting was the beauty of her voice, the sound of her voice. And when she spoke, it just flowed straight through me, carrying with it her love and lifting me up into a state of ecstasy uh, greater than I ever imagined could exist. And um, when I found myself in her presence, all I wanted to do was throw myself on my knees and somehow honor her appropriately. In fact, the first thought that crossed my mind was, oh my gosh, I wish I at least knew the Hail Mary, but I didn't. Um, since the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her, I kind of wanted to ask her to teach me the Hail Mary, but I was too proud to admit that I didn't know it. So instead I asked her what her favorite prayer to her was her initial answer was a little bit coy a little bit sideways she said I love all prayers to me um, but I was a little pushy and I said you must love some prayers more than others and she recited a prayer to me she recited it in Portuguese I didn't know any Portuguese but later I, I think I identified the prayer after I met a Portuguese Catholic woman and asked her to recite the prayers in Portuguese to Mary, I think I identified it as, O oh Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us for recourse to thee, which was the prayer she taught St. Bernard, St. Bernadette, excuse me, uh, St. Catherine, um, Catherine Labre at the Rue de Bac operation. I've, I've been, we've just had the Feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, so I've been, yeah. I've been soaking myself and St. Bernadette for the last few days, but yeah, St. Catherine Labre. And it's the uh, prayer that's around the perimeter of the miraculous medal. See, there's a miraculous medal, yeah, the, uh, which uh, the design of which um, the Blessed Virgin Mary gave to St. Catherine Labre. Yeah. So, um, and, and uh, let's see what other questions. Uh, most of the experience or much of the experience was being overwhelmed by her presence. And um, just, there's no way to explain that, except that I saw in this experience that she was the conduit between divinity and humanity, and that all of the grace that flowed from divinity into humanity flowed through the Blessed Virgin Mary. So anyway, so most of my questions just came from being overwhelmed by who she was. At one point, I said to her, I asked her, how can it be? How is it possible that you're so magnificent, that you're so glorious, that you're so exalted? How can it be? And she just looked down at me almost with pity and shook her head gently. And she said, oh, no, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. I'm nothing. I'm a creature. I'm a created thing. He's everything. And then again, out of the desire to kind of honor her appropriately, I asked her what title she liked best for herself. And her reply was, I am the beloved daughter of the father, mother of the son, and spouse of the spirit. Those were my best questions and answers. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it kind of went downhill from there. Um, and I, some of the questions were silly. Uh, one of them was incredibly silly <laughs> that I never repeat. And some of, one of the questions was kind of personal and so forth. Um, but anyway, so it was enough for me to know that this was about Christianity and knowing that she was the um, intermediary between divinity and humanity. As a matter of fact, it was very difficult to think of her as human. Very difficult. I mean, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, when St. John was confronted, uh, St. John the Evangelist was was face to face with the angel, he threw himself prostrate on the ground and began to worship the angel until the angel said, get up, that's not appropriate. I'm just a creature like you. And we know that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the queen of angels. So, you know, if that's the natural human response in the presence of an angel, how much more so when we find ourselves in the presence of the queen of angels. So anyway, so that obviously was enough. That second experience, to the Blessed Virgin Mary was enough to lead me fairly directly uh, into the Catholic Church. And 
you directly join the church? Uh, well, um, I, it took a little, there were a little, little bit of twist and turn in there. Um, when I, after that experience of the Blessed Virgin Mary, when I woke up the next morning, I knew nothing about Christianity. I had never touched a New Testament, literally, for fear of ritual pollution or something like that. Maybe for fear of being evangelized, who knows, but I never touched a New Testament. The only thing I knew about Christianity came from Christmas carols and um, seeing Christmas crashes at Christmas time. Uh, I didn't know the difference at all between a Protestant and a Catholic. So I, there wasn't much I could do other than open a local phone book and find a local church to go to, which was a Protestant church. But as soon as I felt a little bit comfortable with the pastor, I asked him, what about the Blessed Virgin Mary? And he answered rather disrespectfully, I must say. He was a fallen away Catholic, as it turns out. Um, so I knew this is no place for me. And uh, the other thing I was doing in those days was there was a shrine to the Blessed Virgin Mary, about 45 minutes from my house. And um, there was a shrine to Our Lady of La Salette, in fact. And uh, I would drive up there four or five times a week just to walk the grounds and to feel the presence of the Blessed Virgin Mary and to kind of commune with her. I still didn't know the Hail Mary, I think, in those days. But um, nonetheless, I, I had a kind of mental prayer with her. And uh, that was held by the Catholic Church. And sometimes when I was there, there'd be a mass going on. And whenever I was around the mass going on, I was filled with a tremendous desire to receive the Eucharist, even though I didn't know what it was. So anyway, that was enough to, to lead me pretty directly into the Catholic Church. It's amazing. So when you became Catholic, um, did it make sense for you when you studied scriptures and the New Testament, did it make sense in an intellectual way that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah? If, if Jesus wasn't the Jewish Messiah, he was nobody. <laughs> he was really a nobody. Um, it, it, uh, uh, but I, I think I know what you're inviting me to do. But in any case, it seemed totally obvious to me that I wasn't changing religions, that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, that in fact, Judaism and the Catholic Church were not two separate religions. They were two phases of the same religion. Uh, more precisely said, perhaps two phases of the same plan for salvation of all of mankind. A preliminary phase to enable the incarnation of God as man, that we know of as Judaism. And a fulfillment phase to spread the fruits of the coming of the Jewish Messiah to all of mankind through faith in Jesus and the sacraments of the Catholic Church which we know as Christianity or Catholicism, they weren't separate at all. They, they were separated only by the transformation of the uh, preliminary phase into the fulfillment phase. Um, I, other Jewish converts have referred to it as the transformation when a seed turns into a flower, yeah. um, you know, which is basically what it is, or when a seed breaks forth from the surface of the earth and, and, and it reveals itself as the plant that was the purpose of the seed. Um, so that was uh, totally obvious to me. I was a little bit frustrated that it wasn't obvious to the um, intellectual, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I went to a conference at Boston College. I mean, I was, you know, I was in seventh heaven when I found out all this stuff. And I went to a conference at Boston College, which uh, purports to be a Catholic university. Yeah. And uh, the conference was uh, part of the Jewish Catholic dialogue and it was full of Catholic theologians from Boston College, professors and priests and mostly priest professors and Jewish theologians. And um, they had a completely different view of the relationship between Judaism and Catholicism and none of the Catholics, uh, theologians there would acknowledge that the Catholic Church is actually the purpose of Judaism, obviously, because they want to stay friends with all of these Jewish rabbis. I, I was so infuriated. I mean, I, I got in my car, you know, driving like 90 miles an hour home because I was just boiling with anger at this total um, 
uh, selling out of what Catholicism is, that uh, the only way I could deal with that anger was to sit down and start writing a book, which ended up to be Salvationist from the Jews, the role of Judaism in salvation history from Abraham to the second coming, yeah. which, um, uh, which basically started my, my kind of uh, public, public ministry. Okay. And you felt that um, your experience and your testimony, um, it oh. helped some of I the... do have one on my desk, by the way. Oh, um, okay. That's... So I, uh, it's not, it's, it's picking up the reflection not too well, but uh, there, there you have it. Um, okay. So that's, that's basically what started everything, but that, that's what it is. It's, a, it's um, the uh, subtitle is The Role of Judaism in Salvation History from Abraham to the Second Coming. Which, of course, that the whole point of that subtitle is it's it's the um, overarching view that encompasses both Judaism and Catholicism. Okay, I, I actually thought that your YouTube channel was named Salvationist from the Jews. This yeah, I just changed I... the name. I just oh, changed. Okay, it. it was it was titled Salvationist from the Jews um, from whenever I started, which was probably two thousand and five or something. Yeah. But I had to change the title uh for a couple of reasons one is nobody got that right they would type in salvation from the jews or salvation was from the jews or or salvation is from jews and if it's not word letter by letter correct you know youtube doesn't find it but the other reason is that um over the course of time a lot of time like 15 years my ministry uh started out being entirely focused on the evangelization of the Jews and the transformation of Judaism into the Catholic Church. But now I'm preaching about everything under the sun, divine providence and the saints and different spiritualities within the Catholic Church. So people were getting a little puzzled about, you know, why is the channel called Salvation is from the Jews if he's talking about St. Bernadette of Lourdes or yeah, something? Exactly. Uh, I, I know what you mean. Like, uh... But the, the people around you, like uh, your testimony, you felt it inspired a lot of Jews to recognize Jesus as their Messiah? It's, um, first of all, one of the uploads of my witness testimony has over one and a half million views. It's a lot of views. Yeah. I'm jealous of that because it's not on my <laughs> channel. Somebody actually oh. pirated downloaded my witness testimony pirating it and uploaded it with a much um a much excuse the expression sexier title <laughs> and it, it got all the views anyway but um so it's it's been around a lot it's gone around a lot it got viral obviously went viral and um it's had two effects you see the thing is um Somebody who's Jewish, like I was Jewish before I had my first ex mystical experience, is not going to watch a witness testimony of a Jew who had a mystical experience and became Catholic. Yeah. They're just going to think off the bat that the guy is schizophrenic and hallucinating and stuff. Yeah. So my ministry has had a profound effect of bringing Jews into the church but generally only Jews who have already been opened up to the possibility of Jesus, um, who have already somewhere lowered their internal resistance to the idea of Christianity. And it's had a huge effect. I mean, some of them have asked me to be their godfather. Um, many of them have emailed me. Um, it happens continually, actually. I mean, I don't think a month goes by without me getting an email um, from a Jew who is on the verge of entering the church. I got one just about a week ago from somebody who's entering this Easter. But it's had a much bigger effect on encouraging Catholics to pray for the conversion of the Jews and to evangelize gently their Jewish friends and neighbors and relatives and doctors and so forth. Because um, it's almost, I'm almost suspicious that it's rare for a Catholic family not to have a child or a niece or a nephew who ended up marrying a Jewish man or something or marrying a Jewish woman. So a lot of it is indirect evangelization uh, through Catholics who 
hear my witness testimony or see my talks or read my books or whatever. Thank you so much, Mr. Shulman. It was really amazing to hear again your testimony and to have you with us. Um, it's uh, a real pleasure to meet you in person. And um, I hope like we'll be able to meet again. Okay, well, it's, thank I want to thank you for the invitation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to evangelize and for your enthusiastic response to to uh, my ministry i guess and um remember what i said in my witness testimony it's just more gold coins for me in heaven <laughs> so yeah. anyway um anyway and thank you for all you're doing for um uh increasing the kingdom of heaven and uh I'll leave with a final little i guess little homilette which is um you know i thought life was very complicated before I became Catholic before I learned the truth. And I used to wish that life had an owner's manual so we could know, you know, what we're supposed to do and all of that stuff. But in fact, life is extremely easy. We only have two jobs. They're both very straightforward. The first job is to get to heaven ourselves. And the second job is to get as many other people to heaven as possible. So um, uh, anyway, those are my final words of wisdom. And uh if anybody wants to hear more, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, my name is spelled Roy, R-O-Y, Showman, S-C-H-O-E-M-A-N, not the obvious spelling. And uh, my YouTube channel is called Jewish Catholic, all one word. I have a website. It is called salvationisfromthejews.com, all one word. Uh, my books are published by Ignatius Press. Salvation is from the Jews.com. I waved this before. And um, Honey from the Rock, which I do not have a copy of on my desk. Honey from the Rock is a collection of Jewish to Catholic witness testimonies, including my own and 15 others. And so thanks also for the, uh, for the opportunity to have a short commercial. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for everything you're doing. Uh, Thank you, and thanks for our Lord and our Lady. Amen, amen, amen. Let's let's close with the glory be, okay? Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Glory be amen. to the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. amen.